So I'm going to be doing these talks on Angelman syndrome and Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, however, the genetic mechanisms behind those two syndromes are very complicated and they involve a little bit different genetics than we see in a lot of the, uh, the very stereotypic genetic diseases that we talk about, like cystic fibrosis, or Huntington's disease, uh, for that matter, uh, autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant disorders. Behind some of these other disorders, uh, namely uh, the, the very classic ones are, uh, are Angelman's syndrome and Prader-Willi syndrome, uh, is this genetic mechanism called imprinting. Um, also, you can, get, uh, you can get it from uniparental disomy. So I wanted to talk about these two phenomena and what, what, what they mean, and so you can get a better idea of how these two syndromes, when we talk about them, how they're inherited. So I would recommend watching this before you go ahead and watch uh, these next two uh, lectures on Prader-Willi and Angelman. Genomic imprinting is a genetic phenomenon in which a gene is expressed based on the parent it's inherited from. So what that means is you have two genes because you have two sets of chromosomes. Uh, you have two chromosome ones, you have two chromosome twos, you have two chromosome threes, and so forth. Uh, but what this means is that you're only going to express one of those genes if it's an imprinted gene. So for instance, if it's a maternally imprinted gene, it means that the gene that you get from your mother does not function. It's silenced. So when a gene is referred to as imprinted, it means that it's silenced. And this can be done by various mechanisms. Uh, for instance, uh, I don't want to get too in-depth into this, uh, but uh, you can have methylation of the gene, or you can get methylation of the histone that's nearby it, and that's going to prevent transcription and translation. And so uh, if you have a maternally imprinted gene, or if a gene is referred to as maternally imprinted, uh, then in that case, because the maternal gene is silenced, you only express the paternal gene, even though you have two of them. Uh, so because of this, if a mutated gene is deleted or, uh, or, or mutated, and that's inherited from the non-imprinted parent, meaning the parent who you're supposed to express their gene, then the offspring is going to express the condition despite having a normal copy from the other parent. So an example would be something like Prader-Willi syndrome. In Prader-Willi syndrome, you express the SNRPN gene, S-N-R-P-N, uh, it's, you express that only from your dad. So even if you get a normal copy from your mom, if dad's copy is abnormal, then you are going to have Prader-Willi syndrome, even if your mom's copy is normal. So this is going to result in an inheritance pattern that looks very similar to the autosomal dominant pattern, except that the offspring will in, uh, can inherit the disease uh, only in, in, in the paternal imprinted diseases, they'll inherit them only from mothers uh, or only from fathers in the case of maternal imprinting. Uh, because when a gene is paternally imprinted, it means that dad's gene that you get doesn't work. It's not, it's not supposed to function. Um, so it's totally reliant on whether or not the gene you get from your mom is normal or not. And then vice versa for maternal imprinting. So here's a, an example. So when you form gametes, both sets of your chromosomes are, uh, can be, either set of your chromosomes can be uh, transferred to the eventual zygote. So even if a gene is imprinted, you can still pass it on. So let's say the SNRPN gene, for instance, in, for the SNRPN gene from your mom is imprinted, but that doesn't matter when it comes to transmitting the gene. You, can, you still transmit that gene to your offspring, and it can be either the, uh, the imprinted SNRPN gene that the, that the uh, woman got from her mother, or it can be the, uh, the non-imprinted gene that the woman got from her father. Uh, so you, it, when it comes to imprinting, that has nothing to do with passing on genes to the gametes. So uh, in this case, what you have is uh, a, uh, a set of genes that are, are, uh, come from the male in the form of the sperm. And in this case, gene 1 is 
is silenced and gene two is uh, is is expressed. And so we know from that then that gene one is a is a paternally imprinted gene. Imprinted means silenced. So gene one is paternally imprinted. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the egg. Gene 1 is expressed and gene 2 is imprinted. So gene 2 is a maternally imprinted gene because the gene you get from your mother is silent. And so this, these come together. You have two sets of genes then, uh, two chromosomes, and you have one gene that's uh, from your father. You have gene 1 that's imprinted. From your mother, you have gene 2 that's imprinted. This is just an example, a theoretical example. And so the result of that is you've got one gene, uh, only one gene that's expressed from, uh, from one parent and one gene that's only expressed from the other parent. So this raises the question then, uh, if the offspring inherits the non-imprinted mutated gene and expresses the condition, then why doesn't the parent necessarily express the condition too? If you got the mutated gene from your parent, why doesn't that parent express the condition? And they might, but why might they not have to? And so the answer to this is that it is possible, let's say for instance in the case of prader willi syndrome, where it's uh, the SNRPN gene that you have to get from your father, um, and let's say, that, let's say that the zygote has prader willi syndrome. It's possible that you could inherit a, uh, a defective SNRPN gene from your mother. Now, even though you're not going to express the SNRPN gene, if you, if you get the SNRPN gene from your mother and it's defective, then you're going to have one gene that has a defective SNRPN. Okay, you're gonna have one, one set of genes where the SNRPN is defective. Now, if you are a male and your mutated or deleted SNRPN gene comes from your mother, then that's fine because you only express the one from your father because this is maternally imprinted. But when it comes time for you to form gametes, if you're a man and it's the SNRPN gene, your children are all going to express your SNRPN gene, not, the, not your, your mates, your female mates. Uh, so you now have a 50-50 chance of passing on prader willi syndrome to your offspring. So in that case, you have a defective gene, but it's not expressed because it's, uh, mater it's, the ma it's maternally imprinted. You were lucky enough to get the, the uh, in, in this case of a maternally imprinted disease, you were lucky enough to get the defective gene from your mother, and so therefore it doesn't matter because it's maternally imprinted, it's not expressed, you got a normal gene from your father, that's the one that's expressed. But when you go ahead and form gametes, you as the father are contributing the functional SNRPN gene to your children, and there's a 50-50 chance they can inherit that gene from you. And that is the gene that's going to be expressed because this is maternally imprinted and you're the father. All right, and it works just the exact opposite way for Angelman syndrome, where you're expressing the gene that you got from your mother. All right. Now, the in the case you can have an offspring inherit condition from an affected parent, and that goes without saying why that is. That's just like an autosomal dominant condition. Okay, so here's an example of maternal imprinting. So this would be like prader willi syndrome. So in this case you can only inherit the condition from your father. However, you can inherit a defective gene from your mother. The fact is though, if you inherit the defective gene from your mother, you're not going to express the condition because you don't express the gene that your mother gives you anyway. So one way that you can get a defective gene is a mutation. So for instance here we have a de novo mutation. Neither parents carry the, uh, neither parents carry the defective allele, uh, but this daughter now has a defective allele. Okay, so the little dot just means that they're a carrier. So she has a defective allele and she mates with a, uh, her husband is, uh, is wild type, normal, doesn't have any affected alleles, uh, but she can pass, now she can't give 
Prader Willi syndrome to her children because they because the maternal SNRPN gene is is imprinted. It's silenced. So it doesn't matter that as far as causing disease, causing Prader Willi syndrome, her defected SNRPN gene does not matter. It cannot cause Prader Willi syndrome because it's not expressed to begin with. But what she can do is she can pass on that defective gene. And when it comes to her sons, they can pass the gene on, and that gene is going to be expressed because this is a gene that you get from your, that as far as it's expressed, you get from your dad. So in this case, the mother has, uh, she carries the de defective SNRPN, and half of her children get it, that's statistic. So here you have her son gets it, and he's a carrier. Uh, her daughter gets it, she's a carrier, and then she has a son and a daughter who didn't get it. And now you can see that the son and daughter who don't get it, they have totally normal genes um, as far as this goes, and so their children are not going to be affected or carriers at all. Now the daughter that got the defected gene, she's a carrier because she got it from her mother, so it's not expressed, but she still has, uh, she's still a carrier. She can... Be, her children can be carriers as well because they can they have a 50-50 chance of getting that defective SNRPN allele. And so half of her children are going to carry, uh, statistically, are going to carry that defective allele. Now when it comes to a father being a carrier for a maternally imprinted gene, half of his children are going to have the condition because they are going to get the defective SNRPN from their dad. And you only express the SNRPN gene, the maternally imprinted SNRPN gene, you only express the one you get from your dad. And so half of his children are affected. Even though he's not affected, even though his mother wasn't affected, he's a carrier, and so because this is maternally imprinted, he can pass down the, uh, the, the gene and they can get uh, the disorder. Uh, likewise, you can see here, the the uh, the grandson of the of the uh, female who had the de novo mutation, he can pass it down. So maternal imprinted diseases are only inherited from fathers. Mothers who are carriers can pass the mutated gene to their children, 50-50% chance or 50-50 chance, and then the sons of the female carriers can have affected children. Now on the flip side of this, there's the paternal imprinting, and this is, just works the total opposite. So uh, in this case, you can only inherit the disease from your mother, but the fathers can, uh, who are carriers can pass the mutated gene onto their children. And then the daughters of male carriers can have affected children. So in this case, uh, the classic example would be Angelman syndrome, and that is UBE3A. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, so here again, you have de novo mutation, for instance, uh, in, in this male. Now you only express UBE3A from your mother, so he's not going to have any affected kids, but he can give the defected gene to his children and then they possibly can pass on the disease, but only if they're female, because only the female UBE3A is expressed. So he has two children who are carriers, and then his daughter has two children that are affected because they inherited a defective UBE3A from their mother and only the mother's UBE3A is, is expressed and so they don't have a functioning UBE3A gene. They've got a defective UBE3A gene from their mother, that doesn't work, and they've got an imprinted silenced UBE3A gene from their father, so that's no use. And then likewise you can see that the son who inherited it from his father, a carrier, he can pass it down to his children as carriers, but they'll never be affected. But he can have a grandchild from his daughter who's affected. All right, so kind of switching uh, tracks here. We're going to talk about gametogenesis and fertilization. So you should be pretty familiar with how this works. So when you form a gamete, uh, you divide up your chromosomes. Um, and uh, you have a single copy um, in uh, an egg or a sperm, and uh, then they can uh, come together uh, randomly, and they duplicate. That's just what happens when, when you form a, a zygote. So that's the N, 2N, uh, and so forth. So this 
hopefully doesn't warrant explanation. So we're going to talk about uniparental disomy, or UPD. So this occurs when both chromosomes of a pair were inherited from a single parent. So let's look at this. All of these, and this is normal, all of these zygotes got one gene from mom and one gene from dad. So let's say this is dad here with red and blue, and mom is green and gold here. So all of these zygotes got one from mom and one from dad. They all have either a green or gold, and they all have either a red or blue. That's normal. Now, in the case of uniparental disomy, this, what this means is that both of your chromosomes of a pair, these are pairs here, pair, 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 pair. What uniparental disomy means is that both of your chromosomes in a pair came from one parent. So it would be as if uh, a, the zygote had a red and a blue or a green and a gold, or maybe even two greens, or two golds, or two reds, or two blues. But both chromosomes in a pair came from one parent, and they're lacking from the other parent. That is uniparental disomy. Now, as you probably suspected, there's going to be a couple different types of uniparental disomy. So the first type is uniparental isodisomy. And what this means is that you get two chromosomes from the same parent, uh, but the two chromosomes in the pair are absolutely identical. So that's totally different from what normally happens. So what that means is that you have two chromosomes and they're both the same as one of your parents' chromosomes in their pair. So it would be, for instance, if, uh, if, if the zygote had two reds or two blues, uh, they have uh, their parent had a pair, and they express one of those chromosomes in the pair, and then they have another uh, of that same chromosome in the pair. So how does this happen? Typically this occurs because there was originally a monosomy of that chromosome, but that monosomic chromosome duplicated, and so now they have two of those chromosomes, but those chromosomes are absolutely identical. And this can be a big problem when we're talking about autosomal recessive diseases because you can have just one parent who, who has an autosomal recessive allele, doesn't express a disease, but if that chromosome duplicates, then now you have two autosomal recessive uh, alleles and now you'll express a condition. So this is called monosomy rescue. So you get, uh, you have uh, zero of a particular chromosome from mom, uh, you have one from dad, and you've got uh, now only, you have a monosomy, you have uh, only one uh, chromosome, and that chromosome then duplicates, and that's called monosomy rescue. And in this case, it's uniparental isodisomy because you have two chromosomes that are absolutely identical, and they both came from one parent. So isodisomy means identical chromosomes, uniparental means it came from one parent, and isodisomy implies one parent because uh, if you have two chromosomes that are identical, they had to come from one source. Now, there's another type of uh, uniparental disomy, and that's called uniparental heterodisomy. And what this means is that, again, you have both chromosomes that are inherited from the same parent, but the two chromosomes in the pair are different, meaning that the child has the same chromosome pair complement as the parent. So how does this happen? Usually this occurs because there was a, originally a trisomy, but then one of those chromosomes got kicked out. And so uh, one daughter cell was disomic, which is going to live and survive on and, and replicate, but the other was monosomic, and that cell line is going to die off. So here's an example. You get one from one parent, another uh, two from another parent, where you should normally get one. So now you have three chromosomes, uh, you have a trisomy. And so when those go to uh, separate, you'll get uh, one daughter cell that has one chromosome and another daughter cell that has two chromosomes. And this is like a non-disjunction. You can think of it like that because you're getting unequal copies uh, between daughter cells. So what uniparental heterodisomy means is that you have the same uh, set, you have the same complement in your pair as one of your parents. So you can see in this case, let's say red and blue is the father, and green and gold is the mother. 
in, in this case here, this top one, this is uniparenteral heterodiasmy because this zygote has the same chromosome complement as the mother. Now you can also, through trisomy rescue, get your normal biparenteral disomy, where you get a chromosome from mom and a chromosome from dad. So let's say you've got red, green, and gold, and you happen to kick out red, then yes, you have a uniparenteral heterodisomy because you only have chromosomes from mom. Uh, if you kick out green, though, then you have red and gold. You've got one from mom, one from dad, and uh, that's just regular old biparental diasomy that you would normally get uh, through normal uh, zygote formation. Uh, or if you kick out gold, same thing. You've got one from dad, one from mom, so that's biparental diasomy. So a little bit more complicated when we talk about trisomy rescue, but you can see how you wind up with this uniparental hetero heterodiasomy. With the monosomy rescue, how you get uniparental isodiasomy, it makes sense that it happens from that because you have to have a duplication in order to get two chromosomes out of one. And so you're going to have two identical chromosomes because you had a template, that one monosomic chromosome, and now you have two, but they're the same thing. So the biggest consequence of uniparental diasomy is that when a child inherits both chromosomes from one parent, they will be missing a non-imprinted gene if, uh, if we're talking about imprinted conditions. So let's say that you uh, had a uh, uniparental diasomy uh, one way or another, and you inherited two copies of chromosome 15 from dad then what that means is that you are going to have Angelman syndrome because you don't have a functioning copy of UB3A because you didn't get a maternal gene. And then, of course, the other consequence is that you can get autosomal recessive conditions uh, just because only one parent has uh, the recessive allele, but you get two copies of it. So along with inheritance, uh, uniparental diasomy is a cause of imprinted genetic disorders, which makes sense why, because you get two genes from the same parent, and so you, you're going to miss out on the non-imprinted gene if there's one present. Um, and so this is the cause, uniparental diasomy is the cause of 25 to 29% of Prader-Willi cases, uh, but about 5% of Angelman's cases. And the other way you can get it is just a uh, sort of what we were talking about earlier, like you inherit a defected allele that's not expressed in the parent. So Prader-Willi syndrome, we've been talking to uh, talking about up till now. This is a complex genetic developmental condition. It's characterized by early hypotonia and feeding difficulties, followed by disabling insatiable appetite, which is probably the hallmark uh, symptom in the disorder, which almost invariably leads to obesity in most patients. It's very disabling. And this is due to a mutation or a deletion of the SNRPN gene, which is located uh, on the Q uh, tail of chromosome 15. And this is either inherited from the father or you acquire it by maternal uniparental disomy because you need to get the gene from your father. So if you have two genes from your mother in uniparental disomy, you will have Prader-Willi syndrome if it's chromosome 15 we're talking about. So here's uh, a sort of complex, uh, oh, that's for Angelman syndrome, shoot. Okay, here's Prader-Willi syndrome. All right, uh, so here's a, a sort of complex example. Uh, so for instance, you have a uh, male and female uh, gamete, and you can inherit either of the SNRPN genes from your dad, either of the UBE3A genes from your dad. It doesn't matter at that point that one is imprinted and the other is not. Um, so you've got, uh, you've got a zygote that inherited two copies of the SNRPN gene, two copies of the UBE3A gene. The SNRPN gene that you got from, uh, from mom is going to be methylated and uh, silenced. And the SNRPN gene that, uh, or the UBE3A gene that you got from dad is going to be silenced, methylated, imprinted, whatever you want to call it. So you have a functional copy of SNRPN, you have a functional copy of UBE3A, and this is normal. This would be a normal case, all right? Now, on the other hand, a way that you can inherit Prader-Willi syndrome is, for instance, if your father has on his SNRPN gene, let's say that is a defective SNRPN gene 
but it's the one he inherited from his mother, and therefore it's not expressed. So he does not have prader willi syndrome because his SNRPIN gene that's supposed to function, he got from his dad, and it's normal. But the SNRPIN gene he got from his mom, it has a mutation or a deletion. And so while he doesn't express prader willi syndrome, uh, he does have a defective gene that he can pass on to his children. And remember, the father is the one that is responsible for giving the SNRPIN gene uh, that is going to function. And therefore, if he passes on the defective SNRPIN gene to his child, then they will have prader willi syndrome. Whereas if it were a mother that had a defective gene, then one of her children can be carriers. So when it comes to gametogenesis, half of his sperm are going to have the normal SNRPIN gene, and half of them are going to have the abnormal SNRPIN gene. And then with the mother, in this case, she's normal, completely normal, so she's going to contribute the UBE3A. So when it comes to children, the possible genotypes are either normal, if they get the normal uh, SNRPIN gene, or they will have prader willi syndrome if they have the abnormal SNRPIN gene. So you have a SNRPIN gene from your mother, but it doesn't function because it's imprinted and silenced. And then you've got the, you inherited the mutated gene from your dad, and that's going to function abnormally, and this leads to prader willi syndrome. Now, of course, the other way you can get, uh, that you can get prader willi syndrome is if you just inherited two copies from your mother through uh, maternal uniparental disomy. In that case, you would have, rather than a mutation, you would just have two SNRPIN genes that are imprinted and silenced, and therefore it would be functionally the same as if you had a mutation or deletion. Okay, now, Angelman syndrome is uh, something else, uh, but it's related in as much as the, uh, there are some similar symptoms, uh, but uh, it's related in that the, the gene is found on the same chromosome, very, actually very close uh, to, as far as, you know, we're talking on DNA, we're talking about millions and millions of base pairs, but it is close to the SNRPIN gene. This is the UBE3A gene. And it's inherited from the mother. The functional gene is inherited from the mother. Um, and so this is a complex genetic neurobehavioral condition, which is primarily characterized by uh, ataxia. So they're going to have very diff difficult time walking. They'll have an abnormal gait. Uh, if they do walk, uh, they'll have very limited speech. You may uh, find that they seem similar to autistic. Uh, and then they can have seizures. Uh, and then the very characteristic symptom and the one USMLE likes to drop at you and which makes it kind of obvious if you know this is these laughing paroxysms and they tend to have a very happy demeanor. So this is, like I said, due to the mutation on UB3A uh, gene. And this gene is, is, expressed, uh, is expressed primarily in the brain and so that's why it leads to all of these neurologic conditions like ataxia and uh, lack of speech and seizures and uh, so uh, let's go back here. So this this is very similar to how the whole prader willi syndrome uh, work that we looked at um, but in this case though you have, have to have a mutation in the mother if you inherit it and so the mother has a UBE3A mutation but it's on an imprinted gene so the one that she got from her father uh, so she's a carrier, but she doesn't express it because the UB3A gene she got from her mother is normal. Uh, but when she makes eggs, half of her eggs are going to be uh, are, are going to express the UBE3A gene that's uh, that's mutated or deleted, and the other half will be normal. And so half of her children will then have Angelman syndrome, and then half won't, depending on which egg was fertilized. 